I'm really glad Tom got the politics question <laughs> instead of me, but I, I will cover a bit of that actually in my talk, so that's relevant. Um, so I'm the project manager for the Bertarelli program in marine science, which is a program that incorporates some work that Anna does, some work that Jessica does, some work that Tom does. Um, and our overarching aim uh, really has been to look at one of the world's biggest marine protected areas and ask objectively, does it work? <clears throat> does it work? Um, so my job is to bring together about 88 scientists from across the world into a productive team uh, and put their work in the in the service of conservation. So I'm, my, my talk's a bit of an outlier as well in that I'm not really going to be talking so much about the content of the science, but more about how we deliver that science and then what we do with the science to inform the, the management of this marine protected area. So this means that we're working in a bigger universe than just the natural sciences. We're, we're working in, a, in an environment with big money and some big politics and some big personalities. So it's it's complicated. There are huge opportunities from working in such a big, remote, highly protected environment, but they come with immense challenges. So I'll, I'll talk about some of those as well. So I'll talk a, a bit about the sort of background and the history and politics because it's relevant to the way we do our work. Um, but just starting with the physical environment of the place and where it is. The Chagos Archipelago is at the end of a submarine mountain range called the Chagos Lakadiv Ridge, which runs down from India uh, all the way down through the Maldives uh, to the Chagos. It's still volcanically very active. These are very young islands. We think the soils there are probably only about a thousand years, years old. So um, it's an interesting place. It's very remote, 500 kilometers to the next nearest island in, in Gan in the Maldives to the north um, uh, and really a long way from anywhere. In terms of this, in, in very, very broad terms, the bathymetry gives us an idea of the overall shape of the archipelago. We've got this huge feature in the middle, the Great Chagos Bank. I can't even see that. Uh, the, the Great Chagos Bank, over 12,000 square kilometers, um, the world's largest living coral atoll, and then smaller atolls around to the north, south, and west. And then over to the east, there is this steep ridge and this drop off into the abyssal plain. So in geomorphological terms, it's a very interesting, um, very diverse environment. And all of these oceanographic and terrestrial habitats are all within this thin red line, which denotes the boundary uh, of the protected area. So in terms of the history, the human history is very short, but very eventful. Um, oral history from the Maldives shows, uh, re records stranded sailors, occasionally being found in the Chagos Archipelago, but they were really considered too far from the Maldives, which is the next nearest place, to be settled permanently. So they were sort of left as just an occasional refuge. First Europeans to describe the islands were the Portuguese in the 16th century, and it was the French that first actually laid a claim on the territory in the 1770s, introducing coconut plantations for copra farming and bringing workers to those plantations to work them. So the islands uh, were ceded to the British in 1814, um, and they were jointly administered from that point with Mauritius, uh, which was also a British territory at the time. Then when Mauritius gained its independence in 1968, this is where it all gets controversial. Um, when Mauritius gained its independence in 1968, the UK uh, held on to the Chagos Archipelago, renamed it the British Indian Ocean Territory, um, and then removed the population of people that were living there uh, to build a joint military facility, uh, a naval facility, sorry, with, with the Americans on the biggest island of, of Diego Garcia in the south. So since then, that naval facility has been the only resident population of people. So it's about 50 years it's been depopulated. Um, and it's been contested uh, both in terms of the sovereignty of the islands and in terms of the rights of that displaced population to resettle. It's been contested ever since uh, in a series of court cases which continue to, to, to roll on and on. So, what we've got by 2010 is a decision by the UK government to declare the vast majority of this, uh, of the EEZ, which is 640,000 square kilometers, uh, strictly no-take MPA with no fishing and no extractive industries of any kind. Um, it was the world's biggest for several years between 2010 and I think 2016. There is, to the south, you'll see uh, Diego, the island of Diego Garcia. There's a three-mile exclusion zone 
around that island, um, which means that it's not part of the marine protected area because of the naval facility. And within that three mile zone, there is a recreational fishery, which lands about 10 tons of, of mainly pelagic species every year, things like wahoo and rainbow, rainbow runners, but also some tuna. Even though DG um, is not part of the marine protected area, it does have other protections in place, um, including this exclusion zone in red, which is uh, where access is very restricted, no fishing is permitted, um, and also a Ramsar site, uh, which extends out into the, the ocean around the atoll. On the northeast tip of the atoll um, is a, a strict nature reserve which protects a colony of about 10,000 breeding red-footed boobies. And across the whole archipelago, um, there are 10 of these important bird areas representing about 15% of the land uh, area. And these protect about half a million breeding um, seabirds uh, at the last count. Just one more map before I move on. Um, the location of those breeding populations of seabirds and the important bird areas that protect them is significant because there's roughly about 58 islands, um, but the majority of those, has, as Tom noted, have black rats on them. So only the islands in these, these bigger maps of the atolls here, only the islands in green are the ones that um, don't have any rats and have some degree of native vegetation left. They're generally the ones that were too small to be cultivated, so the native hardwood forests were not cut down for coconut. So they still have uh, native plants and, they still, and, and an absence of rats. And that's really the, the sweet spot for these bird populations to increase. So this is a significant piece of information. Hold that thought, because I'll come back to that later in the, in, in the talk when I talk a bit more about how the science impacts the management. So the territory now is one of the, the UK's 14 overseas territories. It's administered from London. Um, the MPA is mainly enforced by the activities of this patrol vessel. There's one boat, 640,000 square kilometers and one patrol vessel, um, has a permanent fisheries officer on board and their job is to detect and intercept and if necessary, arrest IU fishing boats. Uh, the patrol vessel also supports some of our science work. Now, vessels can transit freely through the territory. There's no restriction on passing through. There are a handful of permitted uh, moorings there for vessels wanting to get out of bad weather. And there's quite a lot of traffic through that, through that territory. So that's the background on the place. Um, by 2010, as I say, the MPA was in place, um, not without political arguments, but nevertheless, it was up and running. And the place itself was becoming of increasing fascination to scientists. Up till then, science had been, been done there, but it had been quite patchy and quite infrequent. In 2012, there was a major review uh, paper uh, highlighting the value of this territory for scientific research. And the Bertarelli Foundation got interested in supporting science around this time, supported a series of pilot expeditions out to the territory between 2013 and 2017. And this led to a group of projects being selected for phase one of the Bertarelli Programme in Marine Science, which now uh, totals uh, a large number of scientists and students across 24 institutions in six countries. So the core funding has come from the Bertarelli Foundation. That's about $12 million, um, plus the cost of charters of vessels. In addition, we're starting to build support from other donors. So we've got the Garfield Western Foundation on board and the UK government's Darwin Initiative, and that's about another two million pounds added into the pot over the last couple of years. Our first phase of this project runs from the beginning of 2018 to the end of 2020. Um, and the funding that we've, we've got so far in phase one has support, is supporting seven distinct scientific research projects, but they're grouped into research themes, which I'll just uh, sort of run, run you through quickly. The first is sentinel species, which is broadly speaking, the use of telemetry to reveal the spatial and temporal patterns of animal behavior above and below water. Uh, we're mainly looking at seabirds, sea turtles, and marine predators. We're trying to look at where they feed, where they breed, uh, how they migrate, where to, and try and reveal some of the social networks in which they, generate, they operate. And this program generates data like these indicating feeding grounds of, red, of nesting red-footed boobies. So they've been tagged on this island uh, uh, to the north of the Great Chagos Bank, and they're flying out into very deep water to feed, but still within the boundary of the marine protected area. Um, 
some of the telemetry that we've used uh, uh, tagging reef sharks has led us to, well, we had over a million detections uh, via the array of acoustic receivers we've got picking these, these sharks up. And this not only sheds light on their social interactions and their social networks and where and when they might be most vulnerable to IEU fishing, but it may also indicate specific poaching events. So if you look at these, uh, this decline in tag sharks, this attrition rate, which is quite normal over time, a bunch more sharks were tagged here, normal attrition rate here, and then we get this massive drop off, which was the loss of about 15 sharks over a 10 day period. So the, we suspected at the time that this might be a, a poaching event, and that was later confirmed when um, one of those sharks turned up in a, in a Sri Lankan fish market, um, and the internal tag was retrieved and returned for a, a reward. Now, it's vital to see these sentinel species data in a regional context. We've been tracking the migrations of nesting of green turtles that are nesting in biot on, on the beaches of the Chagos Archipelago and watching how they migrate home to their home seagrass beds. Now, we know that some of them st very cleverly stay within the boundary of the MPA their entire lives, but still others span out across the Western Indian Ocean. And we've got the record, the all-time record for an adult green turtle migration, which is 3,979 kilometers to the coast of Somalia. Um, these data are also indicating that up to half of the Western Indian Ocean population of hawksbill turtle nest in, in Chagos. So this is a significant refuge for these animals that are exploited across their range. Um, and these regionally significant data are starting to be incorporated into the marine spatial planning processes of places like Mauritius and the Seychelles, which is very encouraging to us because I think the animals, the migratory animals of this region are not interested in geopolitics. Um, and you can only understand their distributions in the sense of uh, the, the regional movements. So it's encouraging to see the science used in this way, despite the politics. Our second big theme is coral reefs. Um, this is obviously the habitat that created the archipelago in the first place, and it's the one that's probably been the most depleted over the lifetime of the MPA. The, the reefs are in worse condition now than they were when the, when the MPA was declared. So the timing, our, the timing of our program was really quite terrible for, uh, from the perspective of the coral reef scientists, because as soon as we got the funding, um, the, big, the big bleaching uh, events started to hit. Uh, we, got, we lost a 60, there was a 60% reduction in coral cover um, in the first bleaching in 2015, um, and then an additional 29% uh, reduction in 2016. So along with that drop in coral cover, we've also recorded a predictable drop in calcification rate from these, these gray boxes in 2015 down to the, the white boxes in 2018. So reductions really across all of the atolls, completely predictably. We've also studied indices of structural complexity through these uh, three-dimensional images created by photogrammetry. Um, and we're seeing um, reductions in reef roughness, in rugosity, in fractal dimension, all of these complexity uh, metrics. So it's so far so depressing. Um, this is not the first time this has happened in Chagos. Uh, 1998, the, the, the reefs were pretty much wiped out <coughs> down to about 30 meters. But what's different this time is that we have all these scientists in the field watching this happen in real time and recording these early, well, the, the decline at the moment, but also some early signs of recovery. So it's, it's, it's not a great story, but at least we're there this time to really record what's happening. And there are some highlights, the, the odd positive highlight from, from our reef science. The reef fish team led by Nick Graham at Lancaster University have been describing the nutrient subsidy that uh, nesting seabirds bring from the fish that they catch in pelagic waters back onto the islands uh, and then through their guano out through the soils and out onto the reefs that surround the islands. And they've shown that parrotfish grow about 22% faster around the islands with seabirds. Um, herbivorous damselfish grow about 25% faster. And overall, we think that this increased herbivory may aid recovery from bleaching events. So we're trying really hard to wrap this science around plans to remove rats from some of the islands um, in the near future. And this is where a place like, like this marine protected area really comes into its own because you're able to if effectively do a giant island biogeography experiment with all the science before, during and after 
those interventions to remove invasives. Um, it's also good because since the beginning of the MPA, there was this sense that nothing more could be done to protect these reefs. They're remote. There are no people. There, there's no uh, sedimentation. There's no coastal development. There's no local sources of pollution. What more does a reef need? And yet they're still hit by these bleaching vents from ocean warming. So I think this, is a, this, is, this has been golden for the policymakers because here is a concrete activity by removing invasive rats, restoring bird populations, re-establishing this nutrient subsidy in an intact ecosystem. Here's a, here's a proactive management tool that might confer some degree of increased recovery to these reefs, and it's, it's been really positively received. Our third big theme is the sort of science to management umbrella that, that Tom's just been talking about. And this describes a broad range of activities that analyze or seek to directly inform management activities of the MPA rather than just passive protection. So this includes the use of the drone technology to increase the surveillance capacity of the patrol vessel. Um, through Anna and Claire's work, also looking with shark fishers in India to understand what's behind their rule breaking behavior, what might deterrence look like, uh, what can the policymakers do in real terms to dissuade people from, from coming to, to buy out to take the sharks? Another form of fishing pressure, pressure in the territory is the use of fish aggregating devices, which are mobile gears deployed on one side of the territory. They drift through collecting fish as they go and are collected by fishing boats on the other side of the territory. So this is potentially represents a massive amount of fishing effort remotely of this marine protected area. So we're modeling now uh, the effects of these fads and seeing what, how much fishing effort that actually represents. And our fourth and newest research theme is about the environments and processes in deeper waters. We've got teams studying the physical oceanography of seamounts. This was a picture that they just sent me this week from a seamount called Sands Top Right. I can't see my dot moving. Uh, this seamount top right called Sands, um, showing these aggregations of pelagic fish biomass above them. Um, we're also looking at the structure and distribution of mesophotic reefs and trying to tease out what connection that they might, they might have to the reefs in shallower reefs and whether there is any refuge uh, from some of these bleaching events. And we're also looking at the effects of bathymetry on the distribution of a resident uh, population of manta rays. This is from Egmont Atoll. And this feature here, this ridge that runs along the edge of the atoll, represents uh, an area where manta rays aggregate in large numbers to feed. So we're tagging these uh, rays with acoustic transponders and trying to understand the relationship between the bathymetry of this particular feature and their behavior. So each one of our seven project areas is centrally managed by a small team at ZSL. I'm the only person that's full time on it. The other two are, are part time. And each one of the collaborate, each one of the projects is a collaboration between at least two academic institutions, up to eight in some cases. But in turn, each of these projects collaborates with others. So for example, the sea turtle team work very closely with the bird team. They share an interest in uh, terrestrial island habitats, so they also share a very similar fieldwork program. But they also overlap with the plastics team who are interested in looking at the physical effects of beach debris on, on turtle nesting uh, successes and how to mitigate those effects. Um, the bird team in, ter in, in turn uh, working closely with the coral reef scientists, as, as I've said, to sort of tease out the effects of that nutrient subsidy between birds and reef fish. But they're also providing valuable information on where those nesting birds go to feed that's relevant to the distribution of pelagic fish at populations and therefore to the distribution of the fishes that are chasing them. Um, and our team that are tagging and following the movements of sharks is, it, is providing data that's very useful in understanding where they might be most vulnerable to IUU fishing and in starting to unravel the complexity around the, 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 sh the sheer biomass that's found around the, the seamounts that we call an MPA within an MPA because it's so biomass rich. So in summary, the MPA provides a fantastic opportunity which is to uh, study a network of connected habitats and species uh, and create a network of connected collaborative research projects. So that's the kind of scope of our science work. And we've had a lot of successes over the last two years, including over 50 peer-reviewed peer manuscripts. But the program has not been without its challenges. Um, this is a large, complicated program happening in a remote, isolated place. Uh, and it's in a region with complex politics, 
presents us with some really real difficulties. So I'll, I'll go through some of the challenges now um, as well. The biggest challenge on a day-to-day -day basis is just the logistics of getting 10 separate teams into the field each year to conduct hundreds of days of science. Some of these teams are boat-based and they require a mothership with space for 14 scientists, but also a fleet of small boats to get them out into their dive sites. Some require camps set up on islands for weeks at a time where they need to be not only completely self-sufficient, but also recognizing that it's not quick or easy to get them off those islands in an emergency. Access to the territory is by air from Bahrain to Diego Garcia, or by boat, it's a two or three day steam down from Gan in the Maldives. Moving sensitive items around like Tom's drones or lithium batteries, things like this, it does not get any easier through these places. It doesn't matter how many times you do it. And the supply of equipment by sea via Singapore is time consuming and very, very expensive. So the logistics channels are complicated. Um, when we're working there, we're really required to be as independent as we possibly can be. We have to bring our own doctors, huge amounts of medical supplies. We don't have any access to decompression facilities while we're there. Um, when we have had medical emergencies, we found the fastest we can get somebody out is about two days, which is a long time with a, with a, with a serious emergency. Um, now, all these limitations obviously inform our, our operating protocols and our risk assessment, and we do so far have a very safe track record, um, but there is more science activity happening now than there has ever been in this territory. And the more days and hours we spend in the field, the more chances we have that something will go wrong. So we have to be very mindful of that. One of the most difficult parts of my job is finding suitable vessels to support the science because it's so varied. We need, some teams need hef, you know, heavy A-frame lifting gear. Some teams need space on deck for a container lab. We need fishing gear on some boats for tagging work. So we've had to collect quite a fleet of boats of different shapes, sizes, and capabilities. Um, at one extreme, we've had our funder bring his boat down, uh, which has provided us with assets like this helicopter, which meant that we could do turtle nesting surveys on all the islands of the archipelago in a matter of a few hours, which was amazing. At the other extreme, we've got this boat, which uh, charted in the Seychelles, which is actually out there at the moment um, and lost both its steering motors last week, which was made for an interesting few days. Um, so there's a, there's a real range of, of quality of vessels available. Um, I've also mentioned that we rely quite a bit on the patrol vessel, which is down here on the left, Grampian Frontier, um, and she's been a really good platform. A big, dirty old boat, but with an absolutely amazing crew. And it's the crew as much as the vessel that really makes it a good platform for science. Their experience of working with our teams means that they can get uh, six small boats winched over the side and off to dive sites in a matter of a few minutes every morning. So it's become a very smooth operation. So it might seem obvious that the Indian Ocean is full of boats and this would be an easy process, but actually finding good mid-sized options that are set up to support science, that have uh, capable, reliable crews, international licenses, don't cost a fortune. There aren't actually that many options. So if anybody knows of any, please let me know. I'm, I'm always interested to hear more about boats. Away from logistics, one of our biggest challenges has been around team building. If we include all of our students on the program, we're, we're, we've got almost 100 people working on, on science uh, of the Chagos in our team. So there are some very natural collaborations that have formed without us trying. We've got some more unpredictable ones that have come up, which is, which is really encouraging. But there's also been some competition sometimes. There's been a bit of duplication. And sometimes personalities of people just clash. This is quite normal. Um, we've got a range of views on fundamental things like data sharing or dive safety. Um, each of the 16 institutions we're working with has their own particular way of doing things, and they all think their way is the best. So my job is to work out a central, accepted minimum set of standards that everybody can work with, that everybody can just about live with. Um, and that, that is challenging because academics have a single-minded purpose when it comes to delivering their work, which is very effective, but it can sometimes be a real challenge if I'm trying to get a degree of compromise from everybody to work as a to work as a team. So we find that really close subsets of people form quite quickly um, because they've been on a boat together for three weeks and they they know each other really really well. Whereas other groups might not be part of that group and it's and it becomes a bit more difficult to communicate. We also find that different research areas are separated by you know they go to different conferences. The seabird people are not necessarily going to the shark tagging conferences. 
So it's really important for us to get our team together across all of these dis different disciplines once a year. We have an annual meeting in London, uh, gives everybody a chance to meet and create a sense of team in the time-honored way of, of getting everybody to go to the pub together. Um, another crucial lesson we've learned is around communication, and I'm really glad that um, Jessica got that question about communication. Our program has been born out of a deep-seated respect for the scientists, for their work, and for the, the academic process itself. Um, so we feel that it's important not to separate communications off from the scientist in, in a way that simplifies or dumbs down the work uh, in any way. So one example is we, this year we broadcast live, uh, the turtle and, turtle and seabird team were camping on an island uh, out in the Chagos and we got them to broadcast live to the World um, Conference of Science Journalists in Switzerland. And this was a really effective way of bringing the scientists direct to the audience and letting them sort of tell their, tell their own story. And that's created a real sense of shared purpose across our whole team. Um, as much as we operate in a remote place, we're also very cognizant, uh, m marking your question earlier, that, that we live in, in, in a real world that is complicated. And one of our real challenges has been how to navigate the political landscape of the region and of this territory, which is, which is interesting. Um, another big question we've got is how do we best represent science for conservation of an MPA that is essentially run by civil servants that know nothing about natural sciences? So we found that it is very important for us to be well informed about the politics. We need to know what's happening, but we're also very careful to keep this at an arm's length. We do not represent the UK government. We do not speak on their behalf. Um, and we retain our independence from them. Because our role as an objective voice for science alone is one that we take very seriously. Now, we have got really good lines of communication with them. And that means that we can share our findings quickly. And we can explain what that science means for their management activities quite clearly. Um, but that is the extent of it. And we certainly, as, as Tom indicated, do not get involved uh, with the political arguments that go backwards and forwards pretty much endlessly. We've got individual scientists on our program who have career-long collaborations with people in other parts of the region, in Mauritius and, and Seychelles and uh, the Maldives and East Africa. Um, and those collaborations, we support them and we encourage them. We'll be certainly looking to build more into the next phase of our, of our program over the next few years. And we really stress the value of the science in a regional context. As I've said, the, ma the migratory species we work with um, can only be understood in a regional context. So politics will remain a challenge for the politicians, but we're hopefully demonstrating that we can continue to get good science done, even as that all swirls around over our heads. So our current program takes us through to the end of next year. Um, where next after that? We're going to be putting out calls for proposals uh, for the next phase at the beginning of 2020. The call will be open and international. Um, so we're particularly looking for collaborative projects, looking for those that encourage regional partnerships and those that have a direct effect on improved management of the MPA. So really very open mind about what phase two might look like. The decision on which projects will form phase two will be made in September 2020 with the work starting in 2021. So we started this program by asking, does this MPA work? And we've, we wanted to answer that very, very uh, honestly. We've got a review paper in production at the moment that we we'll hope will come out next year, which is the 10 year anniversary of this MPA. Uh, and we're trying to assess the impact, the MPA status has had on its natural environment. And so far, our science has shown that there's real value and protection for groups like seabirds and sea turtles, uh, but there's continued vulnerability from regional and global factors, uh, factors for, for groups like sharks and coral reefs. So our future success is going to depend on us continuing to provide independent science that's useful to pol policymakers, uh, being honest about things that don't work, but also creative with our advice about what can be, be done um, hopefully that's given you a bit of an insight into the, uh, the scope of the challenges and opportunities of science in a large remote MPA. Um, I could keep talking, but I won't, uh, but I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.